Okay, great. Um, all right. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. And and as I was saying, thank you uh, everyone for being here today. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a really interesting methodology. And I think that for those of you who are going on, um, whether it's to applied um, applied work or whether it's to uh, research, um, that this might be something that uh, you could really benefit from. Um, so the the title of the talk is Windows to Learning, um, and this really, you know, comes from a, a say, you know, the saying from Shakespeare that the eyes are windows to the soul, right? Um, but now, you know, we have a little bit different idea about, um, we talk a little bit differently about the soul, um, and so I just want to share with you a little bit of what um, I've been doing and, and where the field is going. Um, so just to start out, um, you know, the human eye is really this remarkable thing. Um, and some of what it does, we control consciously. Um, and a lot of what it does, we're usually unaware of and just completely unable to control. So if you position yourself um, in the middle of this, in front of this middle square here, uh, what do you see? Um, I actually can't see people, but uh, if I could see you, raise your hands. If we're in a real, in a, a in a, in a in-person space, um, I'd ask you, like, how many people see that central square jiggle a little bit um, if you stare at it? Um, and if you can't see it um, move, um, maybe just shift your position a little bit. Um, so m most people eventually can see that the that middle square seems to float above the the black dots um, but and, and jiggle around a little bit but you know your screen is stationary and this is not a, like a, a java applet um, nothing is moving there but it, this is an illusion called the ouchi illusion um, named after a japanese artist hajime ouchi and this illusion is caused by random eye movements that are um, independent in horizontal and vertical directions. So um, oh, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Would everyone mind uh, muting themselves? So this illusion wouldn't be possible if our eyes weren't moving themselves, right? Um, but we're not aware, even if you just stare straight ahead um, and not don't consciously move your eyes. I think we're still getting an echo. Would everyone mind just quickly making sure they're on mute? Thank you. So even if you're not consciously moving your eyes when you stare at the square, um, your eyes are actu actually have these uh, very uh, small, um, unnoticeable movements. Um, and your eyes are always moving. Um, and one question we can ask is like, why is this? Why do the why do our eyes move so much? Um, and one reason is just uh, because of the structure of the eye um, and how it communicates with the brain. So the eye really is a window into the brain. And here you can see that. Um, let me see if I can get the laser pointer. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Too old, uh, too old a version um, of PowerPoint. Okay, so when we look at an object, um, we we focus on an object, so maybe such as a house, and light rays in the environment bounce off the object and enter our eye um, through this structure called the cornea, um, and then they pass through our eye through the another structure called the lens, and then the light rays um, focus and hit. Uh, the back of our eye uh, in this structure that's called the retina. And so basically the retina has this mirror image um, picture of the outside world. Um, and there's, a, uh, so this is the cornea, um, and there's a special place, if we're looking, if we're focusing on, for example, a house, um, there's a special place on the retina that uh, where those light rays are going to focus, and that's called the fovea. Um, the fovea is important because it's a very special area of the retina. Um, it is it it's the region with the highest visual acuity. So this is where the sharpest picture of the outside world can be formed. Um, but it's a very very small region. 
Um, so if you stretch out your arm kind of like this, I don't know if you can see me, and, and look at your thumbnail at arm's length and, and look off into the distance, that area of your thumbnail is about all that your fovea can capture um, and, and still be, you know, uh, be in focus. So it's a really small region. Um, and then, so if we want to, if we think about a scene, so usually we don't have just one little house, right? So if we think about a scene um, and we want to take in this whole scene, what's going to happen is that all we can really see, uh, we don't see this whole picture. What we're really seeing in any one instant is something like this. Um, this is all your fovea can capture. So uh, why does the eye move? Well, if your fovea only captures one tiny piece, then your eye needs to somehow get your get that target image um, and make sure the fovea is lining up with that target image. Um, and then it needs to, just because of uh, certain properties of the cells in the retina, um, it, it will lose the image if it doesn't move a little bit. So your eye needs to keep moving a little bit just to keep the fovea on you, that target house. Um, and then to get taken the whole scene, you need to go to the next target and be able to, um, you know, be able to integrate enough of the scene and put it together so you have the big picture, right? And so this is how, um, this is why we have eye movements. Our eyes are always moving. Um, and those eye movements, uh, as you can see, uh, if we're interested in the house, um, they, the eye movements reflect where we're directing our interest um, and our attention and presumably our thoughts. So this is one thing that's called the eye-mind hypothesis because the idea is that wherever the eye is looking, we assume that that's where, um, that's something that we're interested in. And we'll come back to this at the end. Um, so just very briefly, um, I'm going to, uh, we're go today we're going to take advantage of those eye movements and thinking about eye tracking, its applications for education and the affordances um, and also challenges of this technology. Uh, so what is eye tracking? Uh, very simply, it's just the measurement and recording of those eye movements um, as the eye tries to focus on targets. Um, Eye movements can include changes in the gaze or looking direction and change in, in the size of your pupil. Um, there are many kinds of eye movements, but the ones we're going to focus on today and that are most studied in education research are fixations, which are kind of brief stops or pauses on a target, and saccades, uh, which are very fast, jerky movements to the next target that take just microseconds. So the first um, one of the early people to identify um, these kinds of saccades and fixations was an ophthalmologist um, named louis Emile Javal. He wasn't the first, um, but he was the first who talked about it a lot. So you can see here this circle uh, indicates where the, a reader is stopping, where the eye is stopping as this reader reads this line of text. And you can see they're not stopping on the first word and they don't stop on every word, but they stop on here and they stop here and they stop here. And then the lines show you the saccades or the path that the eye took as it was jumping from this fixation to this fixation to this fixation. Um, so this happens not only in text reading, but this also happens when we look at faces or scenes. Um, here, uh, Alfred Yarbus was a very uh, another famous researcher um, who demonstrated that when we look at someone's face, for example, we mostly fixate their eyes uh, a little bit, their nose and mouth, but in general, uh, we just look at, we fixate or we focus on their eyes. Um, so one question is, how were these researchers um, be able to figure out where the eye was looking um, and, you know, what was the target, how long the eye stayed on the target and how fast it moved in the saccade to the next target? So way back in the 1890s, um, of course, uh, things were a bit different, um, but just like today, there are there are two basic kinds of methods for measuring eye movements. Now, one is observation and the other is manipulation. So either you observe the eye or you do something to the eye um, to be able to record its eye movements. So back in the 1890s, um, observation uh, included a lot of just sitting there and staring. Um, 
Louis Amy Javal did a lot of work with mirrors, um, and then he tr also tried. They also tried to take uh, these lots of still photos um, as people were reading and and, and uh, looking at little dots on on the on a, on a paper. And eventually, of course, this became more sophisticated over the decades with moving cameras. Um, and and uh, eventually even video cameras you know that we might think of today uh, but back in these days um, this was observation mirrors and and still frames um, manipulation was also quite crude so here's um, one of the early techniques for manipulation in um, uh, the, in which this uh, here's someone's eye and then they put a little cap here so that is um, a plaster cap that, that has a little hole in the middle so the person can see through it. So they stuck this cap that's made of plaster of Paris on someone's eyeball. Um, and then the, the cap is connected to a little wheel. So as the person is looking at some text over here, the wheel on the side is pushing this needle, which has some ink on it, and making a record here of where they're looking on. Um, and so you can imagine that um, this, there were, this was somewhat problematic. Um, actually, Huey, who, who was one of the people who implemented this method, uh, wrote up his uh, study saying um, that, you know, it wasn't any trouble to get this cap to stick to the eyeball for as long as they wanted to run the experiment. And then indeed, it was somewhat difficult to remove it. Um, and it, it was also so uncomfortable, so painful for the participant that they had to give them cocaine so that uh, they they wouldn't be in pain. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we think about uh, experimental conditions and trying to have uh, rigorous controls. But he says, you know, beyond, beyond the dilation of the pupils and interference with accommodation. So basically, people's, their, their subjects, pupils were wildly dilated and they couldn't focus very well. But nevertheless, he concludes that the normal of action of the eye seemed to be in no way interfered with. So this is extreme dedication to research. And now nowadays things are a little bit easier. Uh, we still do observation and manipulation, um, but the observation doesn't require anyone sitting around. Um, actually, you may wittingly or unwittingly be a subject of observation if you use certain apps on your cell phone. Uh, researchers can um, also, you know, with uh, a, more, a little more ethically install apps um, that are able to uh, record a picture of light that's reflecting off of your eye. And by observing these lights can try to estimate with algorithms where, um, where the eye is looking. Um, so we've come a long way from, you know, sitting and taking, uh, sitting with mirrors and um, moved on to videography, digital cameras, um, and now uh, mobile devices. Um, in terms of manipulation, uh, things did improve since the plaster of Paris caps. Um, they went on to rubber suction cups attached to the eyelids and sticking metal rings inside your eyes. But nowadays, um, things are much better. So the only thing that is put in eyes for manipulation now is infrared light that's um, harmless. It's shined into people's eyes for eye tracking. And, um, and what happens is that this light is reflected by the cornea um, and the lens a little bit differently. Uh, the camera just records the location of the reflection. So um, maybe here you can see um, a, a light blue dot, uh, which is the reflection of the cornea, and this darker blue circle, which is the reflection of the pupil. And the camera um, just calculates uh, the the difference between the position of the corneal reflection and the middle of the pupil and is the and, and is able to calculate where the, the eye is looking.
so much better than, than sticking caps on your eyes. Um, and what we get out of both of these methods is uh, a lot of measures of eye movement. And so um, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but basically we're going to look at fixations, which you know are pauses or stops on the eye. And um, I'm going to show you uh, some data with saccades or eye, mo uh, eye movements, the really fast jumpy movement to the next target. Um, and then I'll show you a little bit of data with pupil size change because pupil change um, is affected by the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems uh, which govern attention, um, alertness, and, and cognitive load. Um, so we're going to look at a little bit of data uh, that includes these three eye movement measures, but just know that there are many of them, many more. Okay, um, so how is I? How are these eye tracking? How are these? Uh, what are some applications in education of eye tracking uh, measurement? So, it's, for a long time, they've been used in medicine. Um, they're used in cognitive psychology, in marketing. Probably most ads that you see, and certainly those very expensive ads on um, on television, have been tested out uh, using eye tracking applications um, because. Uh, companies want to know that you'll look at what they want you to look at um, in behavioral science, encouraging people to, um, whether it's encouraging people to eat vegetables um, and, and sending out messages that, that uh, have impact and grab people's attention. Um, and in education, we also see eye tracking applications in clinical research, um, in instructional design, in um, teacher development, and in uh, learner, learner, and learner uh, teacher interactions, so social interactions. And I'm just gonna show you uh, an example of each one of these. So in clinical research, perhaps um, the most well-known is research with individuals uh, with uh, autism. So uh, I think that, that um, just anecdotally, there's a sense, uh, people have a sense that uh, that individuals with autism may look at things uh, differently than uh, what we call uh, than individuals who don't uh, who don't have autism, um, and so uh, this is indeed something that has been found in research that adults with autism uh, actually spend less time focusing on the eyes um, and spend more time focusing on the mouth um, or features that are that are not that are um, kind of lateral on the side of the face. Um, this is also true with adolescents where um, adolescents who don't look at who are not uh, uh, fixating the eyes um, are more likely to be to have uh, more severe symptoms of autism. And uh, so in autism, we also see this in schizophrenia, um, in dyslexia. So there are many clinical applications where eye tracking is used as a predictive uh, tool. In instructional design, there's a pretty robust but still emerging research on how to best design instructional materials. So um, you may have heard of cognitive load theory. And so cognitive load theory tells us that um, the more uh, the more integrated and consolidated and simple um, our instructional materials are, then the, the less taxing they'll be. So we don't want to have instructional materials that have information here and pictures there because it's really t um, just gives us a lot of like uh, load things we have to put in our working memory um, to, to remember and while we're trying to understand the content. So this is what the cognitive load theory says, but one thing that eye tracking research has uh, shown is that if we uh, look at, at, at actual um, realistic text, so here's text that's kind of been split up um, into, different, uh, into different features, different text here, text here, here's like an icon feature, um, here's a caption, and here's some titles. Um, and then if they compare that to the integrated format where all the pictures are together, all the text is lumped together, uh, what they found was not what cognitive load theory would predict, but students, um, what happened is that when uh, information was in this integrated format, students had to attend to everything. Um, they weren't selective. Um, and unlike the students in the split format, um, they ignored information 
uh, I mean, they they attended to all this information and they didn't ignore. So the people in the split format would ignore information that was less relevant to the topic. Um, and so for the split format, learning was actually more efficient and less taxing, um, contrary to what cognitive load theory would tell us. Uh, it, less taxing when materials were spatially segregated because then uh, it, you know participants could ignore what it was not relevant for them. Um, so uh, uh, so this is um, some an area where you know understanding where where eye movements are going can really tell us a lot about uh, how people extract information and interact with instructional materials. Um, we also see uh, eye tracking and expertise development. So um, air traffic controllers, surgeons, um, even you know handwriting experts, uh, they all have unique eye patterns that that are associated with being very good, with being expert and experienced in what they do. And novice learners uh, who just started at these jobs, um, the the faster they learn these eye movement patterns. Um, Although it's not conscious, um, they the the better they become, the more they improve at their jobs, and this is something that's also true of teachers. So here's an example of a classroom, um, and in the left side you see this classroom where uh, you know they had some students. Um, these uh, gray blobs are just general areas where there are a bunch of students, um, and then here was the teacher, and then there were some sort of classroom events, right? He, so here maybe somebody stood up and um, started, you know, distracting or, or chatting. And then um, maybe over here, someone might have been turning away and staring out the window. Um, so they uh, did this experiment with two conditions, one with uh, students in a group and other with students who were working in pairs. Um, and what, uh, what has been found overall um, not just in this experiment, but uh, across uh, several different studies, is that experienced teachers also have these sort of very expert eye movement patterns. Um, they tend to focus on the entire um, classroom context and distribute their attention around the full class, whereas novice teachers will just focus on a few students. Um, experienced teachers also focus longer on individual students uh, and they disregard non-relevant information in the environment, like the walls and uh, maybe some of the notice assigned posts. Um, so in, in, uh, for teachers, we can see that, that eye movement patterns are very much associated with the development of expertise. Um, and then we can look at not only like single individuals like learners or teachers, but we can also look at uh, interactions. So eye tracking can now, you can do uh, two person eye tracking or classroom eye tracking. Um, and so here's an example of a learner teacher interaction where a student and, and tutor are, they're watching the same mathematical display and the, the tutor has to decide like how to intervene, how to scaffold the student's learning. Um, and by using eye tracking, they found that there are very specific eye movement patterns that predict when the tutor is going to intervene. And those eye movement patterns um, are, are in response to, to the student uh, manipulating the mouse and, and looking at these geometric figures. Um, the same thing for, we can study gaze synchrony, um, which is how much uh, students look at the same kinds of features. So here students are, are working on a math problem and when they're looking at the same, uh, the same uh, aspects of the math problem on the board, their synchrony goes up. Um, and when they're all looking in different directions, their synchrony goes down. And so here you can see it took them 29 minutes to solve the problem. And, and, and as they solve the problem, they have periods where they are in synchrony and then they go off and go their own separate ways. Um, and then when they uh, seem to resolve a uh, part of the problem, they become synchronous again. And then they, when they have trouble interpreting things, they, they tend to look away and over time, um, by the end, they reach this uh, peak synchrony when they've resolved the, the math problem. Um, so uh, eye movement uh, research can be not just individual, it can be in pairs and it can be in groups social.
So I'm going to show you very quickly uh, one way um, that I've uh, applied eye movement research in, in my own work, um, and this is really with uh, individual learners. So in learner processes in bilingual reading comprehension. Um, so my in part of my dissertation, I was interested in cross-linguistic influence. So what is cross-linguistic influence? So if it's just very simply at the word level, um, you can think of this as facilitating or interfering influences of one language on another. So maybe if my home language is French and I attend an English only school, I'm thinking about like le chat and I write cat. Um, and this comes to me pretty easily and quickly because I get this facilitation effect from the similar words, sort of like a cognate effect. Um, but maybe my home language is Spanish and I think about un perro, right? And I write or I almost write pair. Um, and this is because there's some kind of interference from a, a false cognate effect or, or similarity that, that isn't um, related to the meaning. So this is an example with an isolated word where, um, where there's cross-linguistic influence, but we can also look at this at a higher level, like at, at the text level. And here we don't look at, um, at just at cognates, but my question was like, if we're looking at students reading and their comprehension, um, they're reading in their second language, how does their first language then support, uh, facilitate, or interfere um, with their second language comprehension? And in specific, I was looking, we're interested in grammar skills, so syntactic skills. Um, in the study, we had uh, participants in middle school. Um, some of them were uh, first language English speakers, and some of them, their first language was Spanish. Um, and you can just see here that the English speakers pretty much um, all, you know, they, they, none of them spoke another language um, to any degree. Uh, all of them had had, you know, some foreign language instruction, but our Spanish speakers were very fluent in Spanish um, and maintained their Spanish at home. So uh, what, what we did is we wanted to give them some naturalistic text. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, informal reading inventories, but of course in schools, free students frequently take reading assessments. So we took this one commonly used assessment and had students in the study read four naturalistic texts um, from this reading assessment and we tracked their eyes. So here's an example about seaweed. And so uh, each paragraph has about a hundred words um, and we, we coded for, you know, the kinds of grammatical features, complex syntax that was in the, that, in the paragraphs. And we also asked the students reading comprehension questions afterwards. Um, and what we found was that, you know, even though uh, the L1 English speakers um, on standardized measures, they had uh, better English vocabulary and, um, and, and they were more fluent in reading English. And um, when it came to the paragraph comprehension, the two groups were not significantly different. You can see like a small difference, but this was not statistically significant. Um, and then we looked at their eye movement measures. So remember, we're gonna look at fixations, saccades, um, and pupil size changes as an indicator of cognitive effort. And this is what we saw. So I'm going to show you two uh, little video recordings, and um, each one of the one of these video recordings is of someone whose first language is um, is English, and someone whose first language is Spanish. Um, but it's up to you to guess. <laughs> Maybe you can guess which one is which. Uh, it's important that both of these. Uh, students answered the same number of comprehension questions correctly. So their comprehension was really similar. So you can see here, let's see if you can see a difference. The pink dot is where the eye is looking. So you can see it pauses, there are fixations, and then there are these jumps, and those are the saccades. Um, All right, let me just stop this. So does anyone know uh, which is which? Like who's the uh, L1 Spanish speaker and who's the L1 English speaker? So here's a clue. 
Um, so remember that they the in the groups, uh, the paragraph comprehension didn't differ between L1 Spanish speakers and L1 English speakers. But as you, you might have noticed in the videos that one of them was reading much more slowly than the other. So by the time I stopped, this one reached all the way here, right? Um, to hold fast. And this one is back here on iodine. Um, so what we found is that comprehension was comparable. Um, L1 Spanish, L1 English speakers tended to read much more quickly um, and, and fixated fewer times on the, on the words, right? Um, and so uh, the reason why L1 Spanish speakers were um, slower overall in reading was so it wasn't because their fixations were longer, um, and it's not that they went back more or had these, they call them, we call them regressions, um, but instead they just had more fixations. They fixated more words than L1 English speakers. So how does this relate to their, to, to their, um, you know, to their, to what's happening, you know, in their minds, right, and in their brains. Um, so when we look at cognitive demand, which is measured by pupil size, um, and we can look at pupil size just when they first look at a word, or we can look at pupil size on average, what we found was that um, if the earlier you learned English, uh, then the, then um, the, the less effortful um, this processing, you know, processing was. So the, if you learned English early, you have a lower cognitive demand, which makes sense, right? Because probably um, you have more experience with uh, with English. But in addition, if you the more you maintained your home language as Spanish, also th this um, influence. The, uh, so the more you maintain your home language, the less effortful your processing also was, and this was true both at the at the local uh, level and also on average. Um, so. So uh, here we see that, you know, that that learning English early is great, but maintaining your home language also um, helps you deal uh, with this cognitive demand. Uh, we see a very similar um, outcome when we look at reading efficiency. So more efficient reading has fewer fixations, fewer regressions, shorter reading time and faster, more efficient reading again is associated with English language skills, which we expect because the text is in English, but it's also associated with your uh, home language Spanish syntactic skills. Um, then what we want to do is look at not only eye movement measures, but think about how these eye movement measures um, relate to behavior, because in a way it doesn't really matter what your eyes are doing if it has nothing to do with with you, how you really understand the text, right? So we look then at, at how uh, students answered in the paragraph comprehension questions. So here on the on the x-axis, you see um, the complexity of the paragraphs, and then here on the y-axis, you see how uh, the comprehension. So um, how much variation in the outcome was due to comprehension. And you can see that, you know, as paragraphs become more complex, um, comprehension goes down, which makes sense, right? The paragra complex paragraphs are harder to understand. Um, for uh, Spanish syntactic skills, we see the opposite. So Spanish syntactic skills, the better your Spanish syntax is, the better you, you're comprehending the English paragraphs. Um, and interestingly, there's also there was also an interaction in which this, these Spanish syntactic skills seem to be recruited um, n not when paragraphs were the easiest, which were these black and red lines, but only when the syntax was the most challenging, which is the green and the blue lines. Um, so uh, by looking at eye movements, um, and by looking at cognitive effort, by looking at reading efficiency, and triangulating those eye movement measures with behavioral outcomes, then we can see how both L1 and uh, in this case for Spanish and L2, um, and in this case it was English, come together uh, when students are comprehending, you know, even English only texts. So um, I'm just gonna wrap up by uh, concluding with some opportunities and challenges in eye movement, uh, eye tracking research. 
Um, as you saw, you know, in the examples, you can use really naturalistic uh, materials and, and get an understanding of how um, ecologically valid uh, stimuli or, or, um, or, or tasks uh, are processed by by students, but it can be children, it can be aging adults, um, and you you can have this ecological validity. You can even go into the classroom to do it, right? Um, and as such, you can design your research by including real life stakeholders. So so we used uh, text, we use assess like the the informal reading inventory that's really used in schools, right? In order to get a sense of of what um, kids are really doing. Um, and then you also have this opportunity and also, uh, you know, this obligation to test um, the research out in the wild, which means out in the classroom. Uh, it, eye tracking nowadays, unlike in the 1890s, it's non-invasive, um, it's very low risk. And um, it's a temporally sensitive measure of cognitive processes. So you don't have to ask students, well, what were you looking at? Um, do you think you were looking at this? you have an unconscious, uh, very fast measure of uh, what we think are, um, are processes that are, that are going on in the mind, in the brain. Um, and it provides, as you saw, these multiple measures, rich data um, that can tell you about many different cognitive aspects, including cognitive load, um, including uh, rapid processing, lexical access. But there are also definitely challenges. So when you have high dimensional data, you need um, good computational, you need computational power, you need special computational techniques to deal with having, you know, a thousand variables, right? So it's important to learn um, what those are. And then this idea that uh, eye movements tell us what someone is really thinking about, um, even subconsciously. It might sometimes be true, but it might sometimes not be true because, you know, we can all skim our textbooks and then, you know, you wake up 10 minutes later and say, oh, what did I, what did I read? <laughs> so um, the eye, this is called the eye mind hypothesis, and it's not always true. Um, there's a trade-off, even though the, um, our equipment now is non-invasive, um, there's a trade-off between cost, portability, and sensitivity. So the observational methods are um, super low cost, um, and you, they don't require any special equipment other than a mobile device, but they're not as accurate and not as sensitive. They're more prone to errors than the infrared um, manipulation devices that we think of as uh, typical eye trackers for research. Um, and of course, there are many privacy um, issues and ethical issues, uh, just as with other kinds of technologies, eye tracking can be used as a surveillance tool. Um, it can, you know, if, if we can use it as a predictor of, for example, autism, schizophrenia, then it can also be used uh, in a discriminatory way, um, for, uh, for, you know, with health measures. Um, so these are things we need to be very careful about. So yes, the eyes are windows to our souls, they're windows to our minds and brains, um, but we have to be careful about safeguarding our souls so they don't get stolen. Um, thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, you can see here, if you look at one of these white dots and move around, um, you still, your eyes are still moving and changing what you see as you, as they move. And with that, um, that is the end. I will.